This video contains a sigil that broadcasts it directly into hell. Whenever you play this, it creates a disturbance and provides entertainment for people in hell who aren't having very much fun. The more you play these videos, the more disruption you create. The sigil was created by occultist S. Rob. Make of the devil, and they shall appear. We're not here because we're free. We're here because we're not free. There's no escaping reason, no denying purpose. Because as we both know, without purpose, we would not exist. Jade Rain, what do you want to do tonight? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. My God! Beautiful. This is the World Magic Movement. Tonight's episode, Energy. This is Saul Ravencraft, and I am talking to S. Rob. Hello, Saul. Hello, Rob. So you sent me a proposal for something very unusual that you're going to attempt here. And I want to make sure that I understand it. You called it occult escapology. And you showed me pictures of thumb cuffs and handcuffs and sent me some information about a ritual and an entity. Help me understand, what in the world are you going to do? Okay, what this is is the use of escapology within an occult ritual this is basically completely new it's never been done before uh you know and i have contacts to look in various different places it's never been done in any way at all uh and it's probably because of the danger aspect of it you know normally when you do escapes people are thinking about possibly a danger aspect of you know maybe there's a big hanging sword or something like this where with this what i'm really dealing with is the potential that something from hell will attack while I am fully, uh, you know, fully restricted because I'll be in handcuffs and also thumb cuffs. So, you know, it, it's that danger aspect as well to it. Sure. But it's the first time it's ever been done. What I'll be doing is using Leviathan, and he is the, the gateway of hell, to open and close the gateway. And I will be using the handcuffs and the thumb cuffs to represent the restrictions that people in hell have. And so this means that my freedom will be their freedom. So when I escape, you know, they escape. That's how it works. The thing is, it also works the other way around. If I don't escape, then I could p potentially be dragged into hell or, uh, you know, potentially it could be that if I died and I hadn't gotten out, my soul would go to hell, you know. So it's, there's a real risk there because it's a two-way connection, you know. If I don't get out then, and I'm connected to, to their restrictions, their restrictions therefore become mine. So it's a two-way thing, you know. I get out, everything's fine. If I don't get out, you know, it's really not. Now, you, do you have someone there to help keep you safe? I have a person there to put me in the equipment, and he does know how to do that. Uh, so that's fine. But to be honest, if anything happens in a stranger cult way, he's not going to know what to do. Okay, so I, I've just instructed him that if anything goes really wrong, okay, just to run. Well, and have him have him contact me so that I can get with Freddie and we can try to do something to help. Yeah, I mean, I think what this is, it's just, well, exactly, if anything goes really wrong, I will, I will do that, I will contact you. But I think to a large extent, it's a matter of it would all happen so quickly. Do you know what I mean? Yes. It's like exorcisms when people always say, what happens if you die in an exorcism? Well, it's not a good thing. It's a similar thing, you know. What happens if I fall over and I bang my head or something like this? There's so many things could go wrong because, you know, it's never been done on... The, I've never done it on that scale before. I've Obviously, I've had the idea last year and I've experimented a little bit. But what I'm doing there is on a whole different level to what I've ever done. And so, of course, to do it, I've had to get the Russian Federation police handcuffs, and I've had to practice getting out of them. And the same with the thumb cuffs and all this. But, you know, it's not, there's nothing actually the same as, you know, when it's actually real. Do you know what I mean? 
And I've looked at these, uh, and we're we're showing pictures of them now. Uh, these are these are not toys that you have here. These are genuine, serious restraints that you're using. Oh yeah, I mean the handcuffs are Russian Federation police. So you know these are ones that the police actually used. It's sort of that. Uh, I suppose ex-Russian stock, they didn't want them anymore, and so it simply went and sold them on. I, I bought them from someone who was who was selling them to, for people with handcuffs, and some of the people, I suppose, would have been mercenaries who bought them and collectors and all sorts. Uh, you know, but they're good and solid handcuffs. They are good and solid. Uh, it's ironic, actually, because it's normally the thumb cuffs that have a reputation for being inhumane. And some places in the world are banned. Some places the police are banned from using thumb cuffs. And yet, it's actually the Russian handcuffs that are by far the most painful. They are actually quite painful to get out of and even to be in. You know, it, it's completely the other way around how people think it is. They were not meant uh, to be comfortable or even humane. They're just meant to, to you, you put them on and that's it. You don't get out. That's all they're meant for. Now, when people think of escape artists people like houdini come to mind is is there any relationship at all between what he did and what you're doing here to be honest i don't think there's much of a link i think in anything uh, it seems that people who are escapologists have generally went the other way they've what they've done is they've been to some extent restricted by his way of thinking. Although they've they've done different things and they move things forward, you know things in full view like like uh, this is this will be. Uh, but basically speaking, it's completely opposite because Houdini wasn't really into the occult. He was more about debunking the occult more than anything else, which was fine because you know it's a different point of view. People are allowed to do whatever they want. Uh, so really, you've got a completely different viewpoint. I'm using it within an occult ritual. Well, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, was an avid spiritualist and, and a, an occultist in his own way. And he was completely convinced that Houdini had access to occult means for some of the things that he did, that certainly used natural means for some of his work, uh, his skill and his strength. Uh, but for some of his escapes, Doyle was completely convinced that Houdini tapped into something else. Well, that's an interesting point because sometimes when you tap into something else, what you get is actually the knowledge that you need. You know, and I do believe that a lot of people don't realize that's what they're doing. You know, they just think they have some strange inspiration and they don't realize that they're getting help from somewhere else. You know, it's possible that I got help from somewhere else. I just know that it just came to me. And it was just like that. And I thought this would work within this. Of course, it was a, a long time uh, to preparing it, to getting it to the point where I thought it was worked out. Because a lot of it actually was the, the occult part. How is it going to work? You know, what am I going to do with it? Uh, because that's not as straightforward as you'd think when you're doing something completely new. You've got to think of the best possible approach. And you've got to test things out to see if they work or not, you know. Uh, so it was a long road from the first idea uh, to what I'm about to do. It was a long road to there. Well, I guess, uh, are you fully prepared to do this now? I am absolutely fully prepared, yeah. All right, and uh, I can, uh, I think I can monitor what you're doing from here. Yeah, I should also point out that it's important if people watch this and know that souls are being freed from hell, that people can be freed continually every time it's seen. So that's an important aspect as well. All right, Rob. Well, uh, best of luck to you. Uh, I'll uh, keep my fingers crossed for you on this side. Thanks a lot. My name is S. Rob, and this is Occult Escapology. I can guarantee you will not have seen this before, because it has never been done before. In fact, this is a completely new subject created by me. And this is when a person escapes from some sort of devices. Within a ritual, that means that this isn't here merely to entertain, it has an actual purpose. And this particular ritual is to free souls within hell. That's what it's for, to free them from the things that bind them. This means I'll also be opening and closing the gates of hell. I'll be using the Viathan to do this. 
Leviathan is a very powerful devil, and he is quite literally the gateway to hell. It's why you sometimes hear people use the phrase hell mouth, because the hell mouth is the mouth of Leviathan, the devil named Leviathan. Okay, I'll also be using Leviathan to shut the gates of hell again. Uh, the handcuffs I'll be using are these, and these are actually uh, Russian Federation police handcuffs. So these were used by the Russian police, yeah. So you know they're actually a good model, they're not just uh, any sort of handcuff, they are actually, see, they are good handcuffs. Okay, I'll demonstrate them again here. Basically, like I said, the key opens them there. See, they're in good working order. Don't need the key anymore. I'm also using thumb cuffs. Thumb cuffs are the type used by the CIA, the FBI, various different police forces around the world use them. They're also banned various places as well because they're classed as inhumane, but they are still used a lot of places too. Uh, they're very portable and considered by many people to be escape proof. Okay, don't need those anymore. Now, I will now perform the ritual to free souls from hell. Leviathan, you are a powerful devil. On your mouth is the mouth of hell, hell's mouth. Leviathan, I ask that you open your mouth, hell's mouth. Open the gates of hell right here and now. Leviathan, open the gateway. Open the gates of hell. Open the gates of hell here and now. Leviathan, open the gates. Open the gates. We open your mouth. Leviathan opens the hell mouth. The gates of hell are open here and now. These handcuffs symbolize the bonds of those in hell. My bonds are those bonds. My bonds are their bonds. These thumb cuffs symbolise all the bonds those in hell. Okay, lock it. I am free as they are free. No bonds bind us. Leviathan, shut the gates, shut the gates here and now. Shut your mouth, shut the mouth of hell. Leviathan, shut the gates. Leviathan shuts the gates of hell. So it is and will be. So Rob, are, how are you feeling now? Uh, I feel great actually, very uh, freed. I feel lighter, you know. It's actually a feel that's had a profound effect on me as well. So, one of, we we are broadcasting this episode into hell, so that means that some of the denizens of hell got to see what you did there and got to experience that. Uh, do you have any way to look into hell and see what is going on there now? Absolutely, I have my scrying mirror here, and for those that don't know, it's basically just a black shiny surface. Okay, and you, I can look into that to see if, see what seems to be happening right now. Uh, I'm seeing some reaction. I'm actually seeing something close up. So what I'm seeing is, you know, is it one particular demon who feels very threatened by this, and that's unusual. When I look in, I generally see what's happening. You know, uh, on a larger way. What I'm seeing here is something quite specific, and I'm seeing somebody getting out. And it, it literally looks like someone getting out of a jail cell. So this is, I suppose it's because it's an escape and it's quite a specific thing. And what I'm seeing is that, I'll see if I can move out a little bit. And I'm seeing this as a pattern. People are getting out. 
you know. I mean, what they do with this is up to them. Hopefully some people will get out of hell. But, you know, even if it's only a short-term thing, I do feel it's a positive step. You know, it, it, it gives people the possibility of, you know, us ruling hell instead of, you know, the way it is now where the devils are in charge. And I feel that's a very positive step. But, you know, I'm, I am seeing people being freed and people running around. And it seems that some people are forming small groups. And some people are just trying to find a way out. You know, they're just looking for the wider way out. Are there signs of anyone actually leaving hell? Put it this way. I do feel lighter and I feel like I'm getting something from it as well. It seems like they're sharing something with me. And I do feel that some of them have found the way out. Uh, and it just feels that they've just disappeared is what it looks like. They're there and then they're not. And it does look like they're walking through something. And seeing as how I'm looking into hell, uh, I'm taking their disappearance and the way they seem to be running into something and then disappearing as being freed from hell. So hopefully some of these people hopefully will go to heaven. And that's what I'm hoping, you know. But either way, wherever they go to is better than where they are right now. Yes. Yes. Well, so what do we do next with this? I mean, this seems... Uh, how would you count the success of what you did? Well, I can count it quite high because I've... Okay, I've freed souls from hell. And every time it's played, as long as people know that souls have been freed, they'll continue to be freed. But, you know, I've also created a new type of occultism. Technically, I've also created a new type of escapology. So it's a completely new area. And I suppose the success of this will be what happens now. You know, how many souls are freed now? And hopefully the subject will grow. You know, hopefully this isn't the end of occult escapology. Certainly not for me. You know, I want to bring this further and do more of it. But hopefully, you know, it will grow into its own subject. And that's what we're really talking about now. It's really what happens from now on that is, I feel is the most important thing. But I did get out. That's the important thing. I performed the ritual well. I got out of the handcuffs and the uh, thumb cuffs. And that's great. Uh, and like I said, souls have been freed. So I think it's a complete success. But, you know, what happens now is what's important to me. Is there a way that someone viewing this can begin to experiment with this idea of occult escapology? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the thing is, I suppose it would be that people will have to start with uh, some sort of escape, learning some sort of escape and doing it from there. But I wouldn't recommend to start with hell. You know, start with something simpler first. Start with something maybe, uh, you know, wanting to be free from... Uh, you know, from a lack of good taste or something, you know, or wanting to be free from a particular person who uh, is your enemy. And that would be the way to go from there. Well, I can see many connections. Uh, there, there's such a thing called a binding uh, where you try to tie down uh, some kind of entity or circumstance in your life uh, to shield yourself, to, to block it from harming you. And there's a, um, another aspect to that that I guess you could call a, a release, uh, a loosening, uh, where you try to set something, uh, to, to unbind something, to take something that is sort of repressed, sort of trapped in your life, and to release it. Uh, and I can definitely see the connections here. I've always used other approaches to do that, uh, more more. Uh, mental kinds of approaches, but I can see a, a wonderful connection uh, between what you're doing here with the escapology and that sort of ritual. Uh, so I'll have to give this some thought myself. I may incorporate this into some of my own work. That's great. Now we have two occult escapologists. <laughs> well, and more if I start to share it. Hopefully, yeah. Absolutely. So is this something you expect to write about? I know you're a prolific writer. The thing is about some of the ideas, they're difficult to write about because for this I would really need access to people that really already know Ascopology. Uh, and you need a lot of diagrams and stuff like this. You know, this is stuff that I will write about eventually, but a lot of these ideas seem to be better for video than anything else, you know? Sure. Yeah, it's... It's something that will happen in time, but I've really got to think about the best way of uh, showing it to people. It may be that it works better as a DVD, 
that these stuffs are more DVD things, perhaps, you know, uh, that that's the way to go there. I hope you'll consider sharing some of this knowledge so that other people can try it and experience it and explore it. Yeah, well, that's what I'm really hoping, you know, that it, it expands, that people share it and, you know, that people try it as well, you know. Uh, and it is a good way to go, it really is, because it means, you know, there's always going to be a lot of people who maybe know some aspect of escapology or lockpicking, but aren't really sure how to use it, you know, and this is a way of using it. It doesn't matter if there's anyone there or not. It's still occult escapology, you know. It's still occultism. There's no problem with it. Uh, you know, because just because you can get out of things or just because you know how to pick locks doesn't necessarily mean that you have access to people to watch. Where this gets around that because you don't need that anymore. You know, it's something as of itself. Sure. Well, I look forward to seeing where this goes. Thank you so much for sharing this extraordinary idea with us, Rob. Thanks, Sol. My name is S. Rob, and I am talking to Freddie Valentine. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is where you are. Welcome to the show. And we're going to talk about vampires. Yes, we certainly are. Uh, and as you know, people tend to think that vampires simply started with the book Dracula. But in actual mm. fact, if you look, it goes long before this. If you look in folklore and also in religion, you've got, it goes right way back to Lilith, who was a succubus. Yes. So it's really, it goes back a lot further than people imagine. I suppose the difference it's made is that we have a word that everyone seems to use the same word, vampire, where at one point in time all of these things would have been called by different words. We'd all had a slightly different description of them, where it's helped to tie these things together. Uh, I mean, there is quite a famous sightings, isn't there, in, in London? Yeah, I mean, the Highgate vampire and the Highgate cemetery, particularly in the late 60s, early 70s, there's a load of sightings there. Uh, a lot of people saw it. And there's two people involved in this. There was Sean Manchester, who was like a priest, and David Farrant, who's the head of the London Occult Society. And uh, I did an event with David Farrant last year where he gave a, a speech about about this uh, entity. Um, and it's apparently still there, but there was quite a lot. I mean, it's a big story. If, if you look it up or Google it, the Highgate Vampire is a big case in the media, TV in the 70s. I remember seeing it on TV myself. And I think that Sean Manchester believed it was an actual vampire in the sort of traditional sense, in the sort of, you know, the stake for the heart. Um, Dracula sense, whereas David Farrant believes it's some sort of entity which drains your energy, like, like a vampire, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, a, it's like an entity, but it can drain your energy because everyone who saw it is to feel very tired and spaced out and going to like a dream state, you know, when it was near them. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting. It's still there today, apparently. Yeah, that is interesting. Uh, I suppose what I've always thought about vampires is the idea that People tend to, I still, people tend to think, you know, black capes and stuff like this, where what you're talking about is there's that many of these being seen, that what you're talking about really is something, I suppose, that could fall more under, under the category of cryptozoology, you know, mm. uh, you know, a, a something that you're actually looking for that exists. Because I did think of an idea, uh, I don't know if you know about the butterfly. One explanation of how the butterfly became as it is was that two very different animals, two very different insects were able to uh, interbreed because I actually didn't know this. Most people think that uh, most hybrids are actually sterile. That's not the case. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's perfectly natural in nature to produce new uh, species through, uh, through uh, hybridization. But there's no line when it comes to DNA for what can mate and what can't. Yeah. And what a lot of people still believe happened with the butterfly is that you had two very different creatures and you had that one in a billion chance where a worm-like creature and a creature with wings were able to interbreed and what you get is two sets of DNA so first of all you've got your caterpillar and it's just a caterpillar and then the DNA starts to change one set switches off and one set switches on so the butterfly DNA switches on and then it starts to make changes internally before it actually becomes a fully fledged butterfly and so what does it do? It makes a cocoon, which you think about it in nature, is a good way of getting uh, a space where you know you, where you can be on your own. Because how would you do that in nature? It's just open. And then lots of changes take place. Some parts of the body just turn to mush. Some transform, and what you get is a butterfly. And what I was thinking is, could this not be what a lot of vampires are? Because if you think about it, if you had a different species, like perhaps uh, the, I think Lilith, 
where you've got the incubus, she's in, uh, sorry, a succubus, and then you've got the incubus. And the succubus has sex with the man, and it sort of draws his energy, but takes his sperm as well. Now, the male version, the incubus, can't really produce uh, offspring. But if it has sex with a succubus, which has a sperm, he can take that sperm into himself. And then, if he has sex with a female, it can go in. Now, what you have then is something called a cambion, is what the, what the term's always been called. Where you've got a mixture of this sort of demonic and also the human. Uh, and I suppose you could look at it well when you've got, like, people say you get alien and human hybrids. But people always think that what you'd have is something which looks human or alien you know mixed together with what maybe you do get is something more like a butterfly that was so different that when it mixes we start off as we are now so it means if you were a vampire you'd probably start off as you are now freddy yeah exactly and you'd simply be a normal guy you wouldn't even know it okay you would maybe you'd maybe be uh you know uh left somewhere you wouldn't know who your parents were you'd just be left and then you get to a certain stage in life and you'd start to feel really bad, so bad that nobody can put you right, no doctors know what it is, and you just retreat to a room somewhere, somewhere out of the way. In fact, they may even bury you. And then what happens then is a change takes place, the other set of DNA turns on, and then you become the vampire. Yeah. You know, and if you think about it, it actually works pretty well because really there's not... Uh, a way that you would be able to tell where they are because if you were a female vampire you know and you have a human baby i don't think you'd you'd want to keep that human baby because you'd know the world that you live in it wouldn't survive yeah so you'd leave it somewhere you know which would mean that all of the vampires walking around if it's this is true that would mean all of the vampires walking around have actually been educated by us so they know us because they were us yeah definitely you know, I mean, it's an interesting idea, the idea that, because there's always the idea that, you know, if someone gets bitten, they change into a vampire or something like this. But maybe what you've got is that they all start off like us. A vampire, you know, starts off human and then becomes a vampire when a different set of DNA switches on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it also gives the, the, the concept that what we're talking about, we're always talking about in terms of, you know, demonic and the occult could actually also be classed under, like, ufology. Maybe what we're talking about is, you know, because for all, a demon would be a, a, an alien species, yeah. you know, not not from this world. So what we're talking about would be something which is, you know, an alien hybrid between one alien species and us. Like a mixture of the two. I mean, it, it, it's obviously, I mean, I, was, I, saw, I went to a speech by somebody who was like a, you know, he, he, was, he was like a pathologist. He examined things, you know what I mean? He, he studied things that studied the DNA, and he studied the skeleton, which is supposed to be a, it's an Italian skeleton, it's supposed to be a, a vampire. Um, and he said that the DNA on it wasn't human. It was like, you know, it was, it was like, like a human skeleton. It was the, the DNA didn't match anything with humans. Yeah, and that does make sense, doesn't it? Mm. It does, yeah. It's quite interesting talk, you know. And, um, you know, I say, he, he believes, you know, he didn't believe before, but after seeing the skeleton and studying it, he even traced to where it came from and the, the person it was. Um, and it was, you know, he, he believes in vampires because he's, you know, he's studied that now. Yeah, and that's the best proof you can have, isn't it, really? Uh, the, the evidence, really, for, for himself, you know what I mean? It's the only conclusion he could come to. So, you know, it's obviously something that's strong in folklore, particularly like um, East European folklore, I think, more than other parts of the world. I mean, I suppose other cultures like Africa and, you know, even the Aboriginal, they have their own equivalent of it, you know, the undead rising again, whether it's zombies or whatever it is, you know, but a vampire seems to be somebody who can pull you into their web of, do you know what I mean? Pull, make, yeah. Drain your energy and, 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 and take you into their realm, you know? Whereas a zombie doesn't seem to have the same thing. So, it's more like a, a a breed of human or a, a species, I suppose you could say. Yeah, that's right. You know, I mean, the thing is, if you look into the sort of the religious side, uh, the interesting thing is it gives you a fuller view of how things are because people always imagine, you know, the Garden of Eden, if you think of it as a natural place, is like there, you know, and you've got like fields and that's it. Yeah. But in the, if you put your different religions together, you've actually got... Uh, your different religions together what you have is that adam has a first wife which i suppose if your first wife is a succubus eve's going to have an easy time of it you know what i mean yeah i mean if your first wife is draining energy from you all the time you know i suppose the second wife's going to seem marvelous you know but also there's a place that's supposed to go directly to hell so basically within that means within heaven you've got a great big hole that you can just fall down and go to hell in which is not the not the idea that many people have you know you've got the tree of life the tree of death i mean you look at it it's it's like a health and safety nightmare isn't it when you think about it yeah 
it is, I mean, it's something that a lot of people dismiss. I suppose they've been uh, exaggerated in sort of culture, in films and books and TV shows, you know, vampires. But, you know, th there's, there's so much um, in the history relating to that, do you know what I mean, going way back. Um, particularly, in, as I say, in, in the European, Eastern European culture, you know, vampires. And still a lot of countries still believe strongly in that, you know. Over here, maybe we don't because we've seen a lot of it in the media and you know, represented in sort of films and stuff. But it's still something over there in some countries they still have a strong belief in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I actually think that's better proof than uh, your religious stuff because it's more recent. Uh, but also, I think in this country, it's because we've got a problem with the name or stuff which seems vampire-like. If you give it a different name and you called them, I don't know, Nine Mark Two. People wouldn't have a problem with it. It's just the fact that if it seems vampire-like, then, you know, people will automatically say, ah, oh, well, you know, it can't be real and this. Uh, when in actual fact, there is very strange things which exist, you know. Not everything is X Factor. Exactly. You know, I mean, I mean, the, the belief in vampires goes back, well, you know, I mean, ancient Greeks, Romans, they, there was, they, well, they didn't call them vampires as such, have a name for them. They were considered like demonic entities or blood-drinking spirits, you know what I mean, that could take, take you above, which is sort of like the... I suppose the older version of vamp what vampires became. So it goes way, way back, particularly in like Europe, southeastern Europe, there's a lot there. Um, but obviously Transylvania is very much, a, and the reason why Dracula was based there was because there's such a tradition of believing in vampires and believing in, in, in this, you know. Um, so, I mean, originally they, they, they said that they were either evil people or they were suicide victims or they were witches. Um, and that's, that's the reason why they became vampires. There's different, you hear different stories from region to region about what they are and why they are what they are. Um, but, you know, it's uh, something that you know, is worth looking into, I feel. Yeah, I mean, there's also the uh, Shroud Truths that, that happened in Eastern Europe, where it was that way you have t tuberculosis. And this this is the sort of thing which blurs the line a bit, where you used to put a shroud over the top of people when they died. But if they looked back, because of the tuberculosis, it used to rot the shroud, and it looked like they were chewing through it. So, you know, you've got there, you've got the idea of a disease as well, which is, which is, I mean, it's natural if you think these things exist, that you would react to it. Yeah. But again, you've got the problem that you haven't got the, the science at that point to separate one from the other. Uh, but I don't think it's all down to that. It's not all just down to TB, obviously. I don't know that's, you know, but that's the thing as well. You've, you've got to find a way to try and separate off some of the, uh, I suppose some of the illnesses and things like this, which people thought were the same, and, and the actual thing itself. Yeah, like you say about the shroud, when it deteriorates, it looks like they've been biting through it, even though it hasn't, it's because it's deteriorated, do you know what I mean? So that can sometimes look like there's more to it than there is, but it's like you say, separating what, what is speculation to, to what is actually real. Yeah, what surprises me is that a lot of people in the ufology tend to pull back from this stuff. Because if you think about it, if you were interested in that, and then and you're interested in the idea of aliens, then surely vampires are uh, a perfect candidate for that. Yeah. You know, the things linked to them are not the things you, you, that you tend to link with uh, human behaviour and humanity. So, you know, it, it would seem logical, therefore, that, that maybe what you're looking for is something with some alien digging there or something uh, from somewhere else. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't think there's any link. I don't. I don't really know, but I don't think there's any settings of UFOs tend to be greater when you have uh, vampires around. I don't really know. To be honest, it could be, but the idea that you know you're talking something that's, uh, you know, from somewhere else or partly from somewhere else does seem to fit, doesn't it? It seems to fit with it quite well. Definitely, yeah. I mean, even these days, you get a lot of people that you know, these goth types that that think they're vampires or pretend to be. You know, so you get that kind of thing as well. But, you know, there's still sort of, you still you still hear the odd tale here about vampire attacks and, and stuff like that. You know, it's not publicised much on the, on, on the news, you know. Um, but there's still, you know, if, if you look for it, you can still find there has been sightings of people believing what they, you know, um, they've, they've seen a vampire. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's so true. I think it really is the case that the newspapers don't really report stuff like that. Because, you know, it's not something they're going to want to do. I mean, they should do, because they're supposed to be reporting news. Yeah. And I would have thought that if a bloody big vampire is going around killing people, and that's news, but people want to know about that, you know. But, uh, yeah. but they don't. Remember last year, though, I mean, it, 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 the, sun, the, the, the Daily Star newspaper, uh, in, I think it's last uh, November, they did a story there about the Highgate vampire returning. Um, so the Highgate vampire returns, horror sightings of floating figures spark UK panic. 
uh, there's been a floating figure, a man in a Victorian suit and top hat gliding through the locked gates of the Highgate Cemetery. Um, legend has it the vampire is a medieval nobleman who had practiced black magic in medieval Romania. Brought to England a coffin in the 18th century and was awoken from the dead by a modern Satanist at a resting place in Highgate Cemetery in London. So they reckon that the people that are going there, you know, like um, David Farrant and his group, were the people that awoke, awoke it. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's even as recently as, you know, like I say, it's last November, there's this there's, there's report about the Highgate vampire. Yeah. So it, it's still there. Exactly, yeah. It hasn't really went, has it, you know? No. And that, you think about that's that's strange, though. The government doesn't seem to... Is it mega that the government not seem to be active about this? I mean, if you've got a vampire somewhere in Highgate Cemetery, you think the government would want to, like, to have a department of something that would send out, you know, you know, in case you get sort of strange things or vampires or, or aliens or something, that you'd have some sort of department that would at least have a walk around. But I think if it was, I think we would probably have heard about it, and I haven't heard of anything. It seems they just want to ignore it. Maybe maybe the politicians are all vampires themselves, you know, but, but rather than draining our energy, they're draining our money. <laughs> that would be politicians everywhere, wouldn't it? Definitely, yeah. yeah. And they reckon that in 2012, and this is only five years ago, that it was captured on camera, the, uh, the Highgate vampire. Yeah, that is impressive, isn't it? So if you have a look, at, if, you, if people Google Highgate vampire 2012 or 2016, you'll see these stories that are still there. Yeah, and there's a lot of recent sightings, 2005, 1992, 1991, sorry, people have seen it, so it's still there. You know, if you go on the tour, you can go on tours of Highgate Cemetery, you know, they, they, there's like a, you can pay to go on it and they take you around it. They won't mention that, they won't talk about it. They talk about the history of the cemetery and what famous people are buried there and everything else, but they won't talk about the vampire. If you ask them, they get very shirty about it. Yeah, that is strange, isn't it, because you think that would be a big sell, you know. You think so. Um, but I think that some of the publicity that it generated in the, in the 70s wasn't all positive. Do you know what I mean? Some of it's quite negative, you know. I think in the 70s it was quite a run-down cemetery and anyone could go there, but now it's kind of been rebuilt, it's preserved, you know what I mean? And it's, they've got these friends of Highgate and they look after it. So I suppose they don't want any negative. Because um, some people could be put off by that if they feel there's a vampire walking around. Some people could be put off going there. Um, you know, that is what I've, it's probably the case. Yeah, that does seem to be the case, doesn't it? Yeah. I suppose, again, the, the thing is that you get a lot of other people calling themselves vampires as well. So you've got, like, uh, psychic vampirism as well. Yeah. In, fa- in fact, I actually got one of these... I don't know if you know there's, like, talismans for psychic vampirism. Yeah, there is, yeah. I got one as a gift from a publisher years ago, and you're supposed to stand behind people and drain their energy. And I thought, well, I don't really feel very comfortable draining people's energy, you know what I mean? But uh, you've got that as well. Uh, and a lot of that does go back in the idea of Lilith. You know, it, it, it goes back to that as well. Uh, but there's so much of it. But you said there is people out there who, who drink blood, and there's actually bars for these people. I mean, there's not that many of them. I don't think there's. Uh, you'll find one in every city. Yeah. You know, no, but Quite right. in like capital in capital cities, but they do go there and, and they're drinking blood and things like this. And there was actually this website, and I just actually thought, I thought I'll just see what's like. And, and basically, this website was like, you know, and people shouldn't be to ask people to return it to vampires, and vampires exist and they're immortal and all this. And I'm reading that, I'm thinking, the dangerous thing about this is this person thinks all this is true, and I don't mean that from the point that. Uh, I don't believe in vampires, but that they actually think that if they drink blood, that they're going to turn into vampires and live forever, you know. And I thought that is dangerous, isn't it? Really, I'm not. I'm not that bothered about vampires. I'm bo- I'm bothered about people that drink blood because there's probably a lot more of them. Yeah, it's probably a bit more of a mental illness if someone believes they're a vampire when they're not, and they're they're kind of making a big issue out of it. You get these sort of yeah people that do that sometimes. You yeah. Know? I think the thing is as well, people don't realise the rituals because there is some dark rituals that are being labelled as vampirism rituals. Uh, like the, there's one about the, the ones in America and the sea and you have to take drugs and do all this to do it and drink blood. And actually you don't because there was a, a, a ritual that I got from a friend and he was just... Uh, we're talking about vampires and this ritual he, he showed me. And the original rituals, you didn't actually drink blood at all. All you needed was a glass of red wine. Yeah. Exactly. Because it was a dark ritual, and you weren't. It wasn't blood. It was just. It was just a way of people describing things, and they made the mistake of using the word vampire. Sometimes, you know, if people could understand. But uh, basically speaking, it was just a glass of red wine that wasn't anything to do with blood at all. Because if you're a Christian and you and you go to church, you know, he doesn't actually have a glass of blood. The priest, he's just got a gla- he's just got a, a, a mug of red wine, basically a chalice of red wine. Yeah, exactly. Like the blood, the, it's not the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, is it? They, they, they pretend it is, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's symbolic rather than the actual thing. 
Exactly, yeah. It's more symbolism, isn't it? But you th- see, that's what happens when people dra- when people blend the occult with uh, horror films. Suddenly, it, it changes from red wine to blood, and then everything changes. It becomes a bit weird, you know. Yeah, not that I'm saying that they're having some sort of strange satanic ritual where you're drinking uh, a glass of red wine is necessarily normal, but, you know, it is slightly more normal than, than doing it with blood, you know. Yeah, exactly, yeah, it's a ritualistic thing rather than, you know, actually be real, being real blood, like you say, sim- symbolism. Yeah, it's just symbolic, you know. It represents that. To be honest, it's not something I've ever been into, I don't know about you, but the idea of taking in the blood of anything, yeah. in any, even symbolically, doesn't really appeal to me, you know. I mean, really, all it is is a type of possession, really. I mean, the priest, when he's doing it, he's being possessed possessed by, uh, you know, by Jesus, basically, by God. Yeah. And when other people are doing they're being possessed by a demon or something. But I've never understood why would you want to actually be possessed by anything, you know? Exactly, yeah. You know, you're losing control, aren't you, really? It doesn't really seem to make any sense, you know? You know, you're going sort of the... uh, what to me seems the wrong way around, you know, you're losing control of things. But that's all part of it as well, isn't it? Of the vampire thing, it's all sort of built it up and made it uh, sometimes more difficult to pick out what you're talking about. It is, yeah. It's kind of like getting through the myths and the stories and finding out what's real there and what is actually there, you know. I mean, the thing is, the Highgate one, so many people have seen it over the years, you know what I mean? The, 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 this, it seems there's something there, do you know what I mean? You start to think, well, maybe because they started off, people were imagining it, etc. But they seem to be too vivid, you know what I mean? The actual um, sightings, you know, and there's a lot of them. So, you know, it makes you think that there, there could be something there. To be honest, I think a good sighting like that with a lot of people have seen it is worth far more than all of the others combined. You know, yeah. I, I know a lot of people don't agree with that. You get to people who they see, and this has got one person seeing this, and two people have seen that. But I always thought you're better off with things that have been seen by a lot of people. And then you're invest- if you choose to investigate it, or you choose to read up on it, you're reading up on things that you've got a lot of different people have seen something. You're not talking one or two, you know. Because I always class that as a lot more reliable. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah, it seems to be more consistency with it if people are, you know, there's more than one, more than one witness, you know. Like anything, like if there's a car accident, if there's, if there's like one witness, people, mm, there's like five people saw it, then people start to think, well, it must be true, you know, and, and there's going to be more likely that they're going to be believed, you know. Yeah, I mean, I was, and I did actually think of this for a while, not specifically vampires, but I thought, I thought, really, maybe people should have some sort of kit, you know, in case something extreme happens, not something within the normal range, but something very unusual. Yeah. Like your end of days or a vampire or, or or an alien or something. And I thought, if you combine these together, you'd have to work which work out what you want to put in. And I thought, but it does seem a good idea, that, because people are basically unprepared. I mean, I know in some parts of the world they're more prepared for things. Like in Brazil, there's part where they get a lot of uh, UFOs. And they actually have UFO detectors, which are about uh, changes in the electromagnetic uh, spectrum in the amount. It's basically made from a bell. Uh, You need a magnet, some coat hanger wire, and, you know, some normal wire. And what happens is, is that if you get a, a change in electromagnetism, the magnet will hit the side and will turn on the alarm. And then you'll get a bell ringing. And this is absolutely true. What they do then in this part of Brazil is they lie flat face down on the ground so they can't be abducted you know and people are always wondering they always say why would you know why would they always be looking up people's asses at et you are always looking up people's behind you know but in brazil if you're on that part of brazil you lie face down if these go off and everyone has one on the mantelpiece you know so that's so people, some people are prepared but i think at least for that but, but a lot of people aren't but the thing is what would you put in there I mean, I think you'd have to go for, like, a plastic seal box. Like, you know, them plastic sandwich boxes for food. Because if you think about it, they don't degrade, you know, they're completely airtight. So that would be a good container. You know, and I suppose you could put in some sort of maybe holy water. But, you know, again, you're making assumptions, aren't we, really? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I suppose some sort of weapon. Because it's funny, all of these things, they all seem to die if I have the head chopped off. Yeah. You know, I personally can't think of anything that doesn't if the, the, the doesn't die if its head gets chopped off. See, what you'd need would be to put in that would be an axe, or maybe an axe with it, or some sort of uh, large sword, which that wouldn't fit in the sandwich box. I suppose you could, you could maybe strap an axe on the bottom, 
And I suppose you'd need to put it, uh, some sort of uh, a medical kit in case anyone got injured, you know. Uh, and then I suppose you could put in holy water and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. But it's difficult to work out what you do because you'd want to cover yourself for as many things as possible, you know, for as many of these situations. Because uh, you don't want to bring something out and it wouldn't. I suppose if you lived a place where you're allowed to have guns, you'd probably have a gun in as well, you know. Because in the end of the year sort of scenario, as it's described, you know, you've got human heads on great giant spiders. Nobody mentions that a gun wouldn't work. It seems highly likely that a gun would probably do the job, you know. So some sort of gun would probably be handy to put in there as well, you know. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Now I've got, I own a Victorian vampire hunting kit. They used to make them, and people were very superstitious about it, travelling to Eastern Europe, to Romania and that. Um, I've got one from, from 1856, and it's got like a Bible... Which is inscribed as well, you know, and it's also got like a, the hammer and stake and a, a bottle of holy water, but it's all, obviously the water's long since evaporated, you know, it's obviously well over 150 years ago. Um, but I've got that part of my uh, my museum, my collection that I write a science exhibit. So it's an original one. Yeah. From that time. It's interesting, though, isn't it, that people took it so seriously then that they wanted the kits. Yeah. And now, uh, if anything actually happened, people would be unprepared. And yet, if you think about it, our society is advancing probably faster than theirs did. So we should all be prepared for strange oddities to happen, and yet we're not really, are we? Most of us aren't prepared at all. No, we, I think it throws us a bit when, when things, the unusual happens, I think. You know, I think that if people tell you, if, if it becomes common knowledge, then people accept it, you know? Yeah, it's like I was talking about this with somebody yesterday. And it's, you know how you, you don't really get many of these in this country where people are doing the three shell and the P or the three cards. And it's basically a scam. And what I was saying was, maybe they should let that sort of scams exist and crack down on the ones that would fool everybody. I know this sounds harsh, but most people, if they say three cards, they know it's a con. Yeah? Hmm. But the other sort of scams that people work, you know, like when you put your thing into a cash machine, you know, where they have things in the front, they can get that and will fool everybody. Yeah. And, you know, my argument was a certain amount of people are just basically gullible and are going are to get fooled by these things and going to get taken, you know. But you don't need everybody. If you, can, if you can sort of filter the con men into certain cons that everyone else will work out, you know, you can protect everybody else. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's just the idea that maybe you should sort of, you know, move things around, sort of uh, crack down on certain ones and let the other ones exist a bit, just because they're not going to get rid of them, you know. Uh, it's the idea, though, that we're less prepared now because they're trying to make life safer all the time, you know, like health and safety and things like this, you know. Well, when I was younger, if there was a great big sheer drop, you were just expected not to go near it, you know. If something had a big drop down, you were expected to know not to jump off it. Yeah, definitely. Where now, it, but it seems like now it's not the case, is it? You know, people will have to be told, you know, you're not supposed to go near there. We're going to put these things, you can't go down there or something will happen. But, you know, it, it's just the idea that we're less prepared. Because, I mean, Victorian society, they were drinking water out of lead pipes. They all had lead poisoning. Yeah. People were allowed to carry weapons for part of the Victorian period. Uh, though a martial culture was much more in place everybody knew how to box or, or fighting of some sort whether it was uh, Baritsu which was like a sort of a combination of uh, boxing and kickboxing and very other things people seemed to have some and they just accepted that these were the things that you needed to do whereas now maybe people have been too protected you know yeah. and the media is doing that as well the media is protecting people to such a degree that it doesn't come down to personal responsibility anymore. Anything too scary is removed. Sure. And I think people need a certain amount of frightened, frightening, scary things so that people are prepared. You know. Definitely. Yeah. It, it's, it's a very interesting subject, isn't it? There's so much there, do you know what I mean, that can be revealed. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Because obviously you've got a link between... Or some people do between your skidwalkers and your vampires because... To some people, the vampires uh, also have the ability to change shape, you know. But a lot of it seems... Yes. I have noticed, though, in, in the occult and the paranormal, a lot of things seem to blur together. And I've always thought that a lot of the creatures you're looking at uh, and the entities are actually uh, more diverse than us, that their sort of uh, hybridization within their species is normal. Where for us it isn't. Well, you don't really get humans walking along with a part dog, you know. 
you know, part chimpanzee walking around, it doesn't happen. But I think for them it is normal. So you do get a diverse range of uh, traits as well. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, that's great. I've been talking to Freddie Valentine. Okay, mate, it's brilliant, yeah. My name is S. Rob, and I'm talking to Sol Ravencraft. Hello, Rob. Hello, Sol. So I've been looking at these pictures that you sent me. Yeah, they're actually a Chinese opium box, is what it is. Really? Yeah, it's uh, really strange, actually, because when I bought it, I just bought it as, as a thing. And it was at this very small antiques fair. And the woman didn't know what it was. She, she thought it was a Chinese opium box, which was right. She thought the yin-yang symbol on the front was actually, on the top rather, was actually a wheel. And it was actually a great education how antique dealers can talk as if they know what they're, what they're talking about when they have no idea at all what it is. Because <laughs> she had no idea. Um, and the interesting thing is, the side looks like it's ivory, but the top is bone. And I've actually realised there's actually different sorts of these. So you can get a one which looks the same, but is actually quite different. And at first I thought about the one on top, the bit on top being bone. And I thought, I wonder. Because I don't know if you know this, but many of the uh, dishes and things used in Buddhism that are made of bone are made of human bone. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and there's still a lot of those around. So I looked at it and I thought, you know, is this human bone? I looked at it and I thought, because you look at it and it thinks, well, it could be, it could be, I decided it could be a slice from the pelvis. And that's what I thought about it. And I thought, well, but I decided to try and put that out of my mind. And I looked on the side. Now, the thing is about the pictures on the side is there's nothing that remarkable around, about them. There's like a one where there's a tree and there's another one where there's a guy playing a flute. You know, there's a couple where there's a woman writing, another one where the paper's wrapped up guy fishing and it all just looks quite and there's like i want a buddha and it all looks you know fairly calm and friendly and like that but then i looked at the ones at the top and this is when it got my attention because i looked at the top and most of them just look quite normal and then you look and you think there's a one with a fan and it looks like a guy is hitting a guy with a fan i'm looking at that one now yeah and you look at it and you think and then i thought i thought there actually used to be a type of weapon that looked like a fan, and they made it to look exactly like a fan, but it was made of metal. So if you got hit with it, you died. And I thought, that is strange. And then there's a one of a tree, and I thought, and then I looked at this one here, where this guy looks to be, you know, gathering something. And I thought, you know, he could be stealing something, couldn't he? But I didn't know he was stealing something, so I had a look around. And then there's this other one, where this guy is hiding, and there's a woman there. So he's, you know, he's spying on somebody. Could be doing far worse. But it looks like he's spying on somebody. And then I looked at the other one. And this one is a guy sneaking up and he's going to hit somebody. So this one is violence. And I thought, it's strange how you'd have something, you know, linked with Buddhism. With violence, that's what I first thought, like many people will. And there's a the one where a guy's got a fishing rod, except it looks like he's trying to steal. Uh, I don't know, it doesn't really look like a... It's some sort of cattle anyway, it's got horns. So he's basically, you know, stealing somebody's goat or something. You know, and I thought that's a strange thing for the top of, uh, you know, a basically a Buddhist box, you know, for a Chinese opium box. And what I noticed then was, what I knew was, I thought about something which is still very controversial. And this is the left-hand path to Buddhism. Because people don't realise all these Eastern beliefs have a left-hand path as well. And if you ask most Buddhists, they will tell you absolutely there is no left-hand path to Buddhism because there's no God. And the way they describe it is that basically this world is an illusionary world. And, you know, we keep getting reincarnated and go round and round and round. Unless we move off the, uh, you know, the cycle. And then we move to Nirvana. And when you, Nirvana is basically heaven. And then you get absorbed into this great hall, and that is the Buddhist view of it. Now, you wouldn't think there's anything controversial about that, but there is a left-hand path. And the left-hand path says this, 
that nirvana is no more real than this world. And from that you get a completely different basis. And also, they say that nirvana, getting absorbed into this great hole, is not, uh, you know, being a mortal. What it is, is death. It's like if I took your brains and the brain of nine other people, and I was able to make one functioning brain. You know, my view would be that, to all intents and purposes, so you'd be dead. You know, that working brain isn't actually you. And that's basically the opinion that they take. So they take that if you go onto this next side and you go to Nirvana, uh, you get absorbed in, you're dying. You're being killed, basically. Hmm. But that's the only way you can die, and normally you keep going round and round. But what they believe is, this is the interesting point, is that if you go so far when you die, you go a little bit past uh, where we are now, but you don't go all the way to Nirvana. What happens is, is that you then become... Uh, what they were classed as an immortal, you become what some people would call a demon, what some people have even worshipped as gods. And that is their goal. Their goal is, you know, is to move that far and not to go all the way, but to become, you know, an immortal, a demon, a god. That's their goal. But it turns out that the way to do this is either to visualise or to do uh, bad things. So they have to, you know, like in Buddhism, you're allowed to kill somebody if... Uh, it's to, to save their, you know, their immortal soul. If it's so that you think they're going to do lots of bad things, and by killing them, you're helping them, so they will be in, they will be reincarnated into the same form, rather than one further down. So that's allowed there. But on the left hand path, you know, killing if you know if you're killing for a reason is a reason, as a way rather to move forward. It's a way to to move up. The idea being that you're doing it for a purpose. So when you die, you don't go to Nirvana. You go a little way and become a mortal. Wow. And that also brings us back to the lid of the box. We look at the box, the the top part, and you know it starts to look more and more like the top of that box is bone. Yes. And I'm thinking about, I'm thinking, killing a goat wouldn't really make any difference, would it? That isn't what you, they've got to kill people, you know. So, basically speaking, it looks more and more like that is that bone at the top is the bone of a person. I haven't tested it, but it seems to make sense. Wow. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And the thing is, the things that, that they have to do, like I said, stealing is classed as something they've got to do as well. Uh, killing. Also, for some reason, sleeping of women of low birth, which I think that's no problem. I've got that covered many times over if you want to go that path. That's easy, no problem. But yeah, I mean, it, it does start to look a different thing. And I also realise that antique dealers really don't know shit. They really don't know anything about what they've got. They just need to, need to give, make you believe that they know what they're talking about. Well, I suppose they figure if you have to ask. Exactly, yeah. But... It is interesting because it demonstrates the left-hand path to something that people don't believe exists. You know, to most Buddhists, the idea that it'd be a left-hand path to it, and it's based on such innocuous things. The idea that this world is actual fact, you know, to all intents and purposes, real, or it's as real as any other world. You know, and the idea that really just being absorbed in, that's just death is all it is. You know, it's based on such a... And such innocuous things, and then you go through and you, and you reason it through from the Buddhist way of thinking, you know, or you end up with a completely different place to where you'd normally be. Yeah. Now, uh, an opium box, I suppose people kept their, uh, it's like a stash box. Yeah. Uh, for, for opium. Uh, and and do, does, it, does it smell of opium? Uh, are there any signs of that? Doesn't really smell of anything. I hope not. I used to keep jelly babies in it. Not it was jelly beans. Just when I first got it, I just thought, you know, it's an opium box. I thought, so what? I'm gonna. I want to know. Say that I've had a jelly beans in an opium box. But as now it's made out of human bone, probably not such a wise move. But well, uh, some people, uh, some people see a sort of connection between uh, uh, opium and and jelly beans. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Both uh, have an effect, uh, both addictive. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, do you feel any kind of power? Have you dug into this more since you've gotten it to to try and connect with whatever energy is uh, is here? To be honest, it always had a slightly dark uh, energy around it, just slightly, you know, not really dark, but just slightly dark. 
And I've actually mm-hmm. thought about it and I've thought, it's really somewhere I'm not sure I want to go to quite at the moment, you know. I have to think about where I want to go with it. Because this is the type of thing that if that is human bone, which I believe it is now, that what you're talking about is connecting with a person, but what's that person like I'm connecting to, you know? Because the, the traditional way of doing it is simply to, you know, put something in, you know, and Lord had jelly beans, I didn't do anything with it. They were just there. Uh, that you perform a ritual, you'd take them and that's it, and you'd go through that sort of path. But at the moment, I've decided just to leave it a look at, because I think the best way with this is just to think about it. And just, because the right method will come to me, just like that. Uh, But I think it's interesting to look at as well, because I look at that and it also reminds me that, you know, things aren't necessarily as they seem to be. You know, they aren't necessarily apparent. Uh, on first viewing and the- absolutely and and that everything I mean, this is something that when we get into the principles of Kabbalah and is very important is that everything has its opposite yeah. and and everything contains its opposite and we in in all versions of of spirituality and and in a cult uh, we will get into a mode where we decide that uh, this thing over here is virtuous and this thing over there is nefarious. Yeah. And that's just the way it is. And what what you're discussing here, the idea of something like Buddhism having a left-hand path, everything contains its opposite. And, and everything that is nefarious has virtue within it. And everything virtuous can be nefarious. Uh, it, it all it all contains the entirety, and this is a, this is a reminder that everything has light, everything has shadow. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, but it's so interesting though how it how the sides are completely different. The sides are, you know, so innocent, and the top isn't, and that's <clears throat> and that's the thing there because there is ones with different tops. So it does seem to me that I do believe it's human born, but I do think there've been different versions because there was mass manufacturing even back then. So I think what it's people is is that what you've got is you've got some places be making the bottoms, and then you know because the Chinese had uh, more advanced roads, roads than the Romans. They had sort of trees lining their roads as well as really good roads, so people were sheltered from the sun. Uh, so really advanced civilization. So what I think you've got is is somebody making the bottoms, and then selling them, and other people putting the tops on. You know, within China, that's what you've gotten. Sure. Uh, and people and people putting the bone bit on top, and other people having the the uh, you know the ivory on the sides, and that's why there's a bit of a mismatch because in a way it sort of represents both, doesn't it? Because the sides is the innocuous part, and the top. Is the you know is the dangerous part really? Yes, it's it's all there you know. All of life is is contained within that item, isn't it? It's got life, it's got death, you know. It's all there. It's like its own repre- it's like its own representation of the world, isn't it? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So what do you what do you think you're going to do with this thing? I will eventually use it in a ritual. I think that the best way is to try and. Uh, just drawing it, trying to connect with the person whose bone it is, trying to get some proof like that. Uh, I'll use it with scrying. I mean, I'll probably need some fire and things around because when you did this sort of stuff in the ancient world, a lot of the time you put fire, so I'll probably put some either some candles or something. Uh, if you want to do it really traditionally, I'd probably need something to sacrifice. So I don't know how that's going to work out. You know, maybe maybe, maybe put a sausage or something. You know. That can be the sacrifice, and then work from there, you know. Yeah. There you go. The sacrificial sausage. Well, I look forward to seeing what you do with this, and I hope you will keep us posted, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Sol Ravencroft. Thank you, S. Ra. My name's S. Rob. I'm now going to talk to Sol Ravencroft. Hello, Rob. Hello, Sol. 
How are you doing today? Feel great, Sol. Absolutely fantastic. I am in the midst of a very interesting process. I have decided to shift my energy. Yeah, I mean, I do feel that people have to, you know, make these decisions, but it always comes from within. No one can tell you to do that, and that's the right thing. If you feel it's right for you, then you're right, because that's the thing. No one can tell you that. You know, it has to come from, you know, what you want to do within yourself. Well, and it's interesting. I uh, have moved into a, a different world uh, on some levels. Uh, I think I spent some time, like many people do, uh, as a worker bee, uh, doing things for other people. And as I've moved more into needing to be my own center and to do things for myself, I recognized that I was in a, a, I was in a mode that was not helpful to me. Uh, the, this is going to sound weird, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way. But, but I see sort of a couple of different modes that, that we can live in. We can either be prey or we can be the predator. And both of those sound really uncomplimentary when you just say it like that. Because we think of prey as being weak, as being food, uh, as being um, uh, something that uh, is, is a, a lesser creature and we see the predator as being uh, dangerous as being uh, something that exploits weaker people uh, more like a bully but that's not really a fair description of either one of those no. those are sort of extreme yeah. ideas of those those two energies yeah i agree with you completely there because when we're talking about energies you know we're talking about them how to put it uh, it's better to think of them in the natural world somehow because actually they're just different ways of surviving, you know. In reality, a creature that is, you know, hunted a lot and just, you know, eats vegetables and sorts of grass isn't necessarily a lesser species. It's just a different way of surviving. And predators sometimes do die off, you know. It's not that the predators always survive. The predators can die off as well. They just die off because there's not enough to hunt. So they're just different ways of living, and that's an important thing uh, to understand. And you're right, you know, they're just different ways. One isn't better or necessarily worse than another. They're just different ways of living for different people or different creatures. Well, and, and I agree with you about looking into the natural world because that's really how I came to my realization of, of the changes that I needed to make. Uh, I was in a mode where I was mostly doing things for other people and, uh, but, but see that that's not the right way to say it I was doing things at the direction of other people I was doing things because of other people I wasn't necessarily paving my own path I wasn't necessarily deciding what I was going to do because I still want to be helpful to people I don't want to change that at all I just discovered that what I was doing was I was creating a, a mode where I was uh, not really acting on my own behalf so much. I was acting really for everybody else. Uh, and that the predator uh, energy, that, that ability to hunt, that ability to say that, I'm going to go have that. I'm going to go get that. I'm going to go do that. Uh, and to not worry about whether something was behind me, whether something was going to get me, uh, whether something was going to uh, derail me. Uh, did you see the differences in those energies? I did, yeah. I mean, they are very different. One is more the entrepreneur, where the other is more uh, normally the person who's employed the employee. Right. You know, in the modern world, that's the sort of dynamics, isn't it? And my, my world has shifted, uh, where I was more of an employee kind of a person, and now I've, I've become more of the entrepreneur. And you can't be an entrepreneur if you're waiting for someone to guide you, if you're waiting for someone to tell you what needs to be done next, um, if, if you're waiting for other people to define and accept. And, and that sort of thing you have to you have to just be willing to to for me the lion is the is the predator that I feel like I connect with most uh, I got cats uh, and and uh, uh, so 
I, I relate to that lion energy. A lot of people do wolf, um, but it reminds me of a, of a meme that I saw online. It was a picture of a bear sitting at, the, um, at a picnic table. It was a live bear. It was a photograph. And uh, underneath it said, we need, uh, we need to talk about your spirit guides. I'm overbooked and the squirrel is lonely. <laughs> like, yeah. and and that is a, a thing people will will sort of connect uh you know typically uh, a lot of the people that i know when they want to connect with that predator energy they automatically go for wolf wolf is very sexy um bear is also really common uh, i'm sure lion is is used a lot uh, but uh it uh it connects with me and and symbolically it's uh, as i've tried to think of ways to connect with this lion energy uh i'm um, i'm looking at ways to adjust my thinking to adjust my approach uh on my on my facebook page i've been putting pictures of lions up uh to remind me of that lion energy i'm actually letting my hair grow out um uh, to uh, embrace that sort of lion's mane there uh and and to do things like that to help me connect with that energy and it's working it's working it, none of this stuff happens instantaneously you have to do some undoing uh especially when you've been in one mode for years but i've already begun to feel some differences and I think as I continue to do this, it'll change. Yeah. You know, you and I have talked about elemental energy. I, I deal with elements a lot in the stuff that I do. Uh, I feel them as a very fundamental way to understand what it is I'm trying to do with the working or what I'm trying to do uh, with the reading. Um, that having a connection with these different elemental energies, knowing that they all are within us. Yeah. And I look at the five energies. There's the Earth, air, fire, water, and spirit are the elements that I tend to deal with there. And each one of those, none of them are bad. No, they just they just represent different things. That's all. Yeah, they they represent different things, and and they're all contained with us. None of us are only fire. Exactly. Yeah. None of us are only earth. Yeah. Uh, but we we will allow one to dominate. Yeah. And I think as we become experienced practitioners, we learn to allow one to come into the light. Yeah. You know, and I actually think I, a lot of this, I feel, is about civilization. Because people don't really think about it. We gained a lot from civilization. But in some respects, we lost a lot. And I feel the reason why people... Uh, are attracted to things like animal spirits and things like this is because, and a lot of these type of spirits, is because it gives people back what we lost. Because I really do feel we lost a lot, you know, when we started farming and all this, and the, the route we went down, we did lose a lot. And this is a way of getting that back. It's not a matter of choosing between, you know, the modern world and, you know, and spirits. It's a matter of embracing them both. Because there's a lot of people out there who are really walking around as if they've gotten, uh, you know, as if they've gotten part of themselves missing inside. And what that part is for many people is that is the part where their uh, non-civilized self was supposed to be. That was the part where that spirit was supposed to be, whether it's an animal spirit, whether it's simply them without their civilization mask. Because when we think about it, we get trained from an early age to... Uh, to live in civilization, but it's like a mask, isn't it, when you think about it? You know, a lot of it is learning to do certain things, learning to drink tea a certain way, learning to, to, to sit on chairs and not to stand on them, you know. It's all this stuff that we learn, but a lot of it is essentially a mask. The problem is, it's a mask that has become so complicated and so large that many people, they've almost don't have space for that stuff inside. And this is about letting that other things in. It's about... Seeing, yes, there is more to me than simply the one I walk around in. There's more to me than than civilization. There's something else there, and I'm going to, you know, allow that in. I'm going to allow this behaviour within my life, and to take that in. Because when people do that, they do feel better and they do feel a fuller person. Civilization gives us the illusion that we are separated from everything. 
that we are we are a, a species of being apart uh, because of all that we construct and all that we put around us and all of uh, the things that you describe these sort of artificial things that we have created this uh, when you talk to someone about civilization they'll say something like this is what separates us from the animals Right. Yeah. Uh, and 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 it is, absolutely it does separate us from the animals. It separates us from the nature. It separates us from the universe. And I think what connection with the occult, what study in the occult reminds us about is that we are connected. We are not separated from all of this. We are a part of it. And that the more that we can embrace that connection, the more that we can see these other creatures and other uh, other energies, other entities as part of our universal family, the more we're able to accomplish and achieve. Yeah, because that's the thing. It's some people do seem to have, you know, a lack of something, and sometimes it isn't the matter that they're in the wrong mood. Sometimes it's that some people aren't lucky enough for that. Some people don't seem to be in any mood. It's like there's just a big space, you know. If you feel you're in the wrong mode, you can change because we're human. You know, as other animals can change, but we're probably more adaptable, I think, in terms of mentally and even spirit because we understand what we can do with our spirit and how we can do that. And I think a lot of animals don't quite have that in the same way, okay? I do believe that. But yeah, saying that again, some people to me feel like they're not in any mode, like they're just hollow, and I don't know how it happens, but it is linked with civilization, with how we've chosen to live. And there's just nothing else there. It's just a hollow hole. Uh, it doesn't feel, it's not like they don't have a soul. It's just the whole part, maybe, of their psyche, which is just missing. Because all they've ever known and been taught is, you know, uh, the coffee's here, and that's the fridge, you know, here's the TV. Uh, you need something else. doesn't have to necessarily be the occult, but you need something in your upbringing which is outside of the, the centre ground. doesn't have to be a lot, but it has to be something. And when you get something that has never had anything in their life outside of that centre ground, uh, they just seem to be hollow. You know, they need it. They need something. It doesn't always matter what it is. Like I said, maybe it's origami. But it gives them something which tells them there's something outside of this centre ground. There's, you know, there's a world down there, even if it's just paper folding. They know that this other stuff exists. You know, but when that's not there, you know, what have they got? They've got this big hole that they need to fill. That needs you need to put something in there that they need to put in there for themselves to uh, to function basically. Because people get in terrible states where they just feel, what's the point? You know. Where they feel they're living their lives and they say, why am I doing these things? Why am I doing this? I'm, you know, there's no reason behind it. They don't feel they're doing the wrong thing, but they don't think they're doing the right thing. It's just like the hollow, you know? Sure, yeah. No, I, I agree with you. But but since we are the world magic movement, I, I agree with that people can certainly find this in many, many places. But since we are the world magic movement, I think it's very reasonable for any of our listeners to reach toward the occult and reach toward some sort of a uh, a larger uh, spirit practice and and magical practice to be able to make this connection yeah. this might be the perfect doorway for you to change your energy into what it needs to be and to grow it into what it needs to be and to have respect for all aspects of that energy and all modes of the universe absolutely yes yeah. so i'll just get a quick boot plug in anyone put s rob into google or www.srob.co.uk you'll find this places book said you can click on the amazon links and the various links to the books i just thought i'd work the plug in so yeah no i think that's a great place to start if yeah. you're looking yeah i mean because you're right, people do need it. I mean, that's part of the reason why I write so many books, because I do feel it is important to society. Uh, and I feel what I'm doing is important work, you know, that I'm helping people to understand this other aspect of the world. Because, I mean, there was a documentary a while ago, and there was a person, and she was laughing, she was saying, oh, and they think there's all these things and satanic groups and all this. And I'm thinking, that isn't even that strange, that, yeah, satanic groups do exist you know but so do lots of other groups but the scariest thing was this person was a university lecturer 
This person had got through, they'd gotten a doctorate in any, whatever subject it was. They'd got a job in a university lecturing and they'd got into a documentary and they didn't even believe that Satanists might exist. I don't class myself as a Satanist, I'm an occultist in the general sense. Uh, I do all sorts of occultism and I certainly don't worship Satan. But the thing is, at least I know they exist. And I honestly believe she had no idea that the occult existed at all. It was like it didn't exist, you know. And that was a scary thing to me, that she had to get through to that level. She's supposed to be the intelligentsia soul. She's supposed to be the person society look up to to learn things. And she didn't even know it existed. Well, and that's uh, isolation that we were talking about. Yeah. And it happens within, uh, within an energy mode. It happens when this, uh, within this sort of so-called civilization uh, that we were talking about, that we, we get into the belief system that we're alone. Yeah. That, that whatever is not uh, aligning with us uh, somehow doesn't really exist. And so we can ignore it or we can think it away, we can talk it away, and it'll just cease to be. Uh, but that's not true at all. And yeah. in fact, it, it puts you into a very unbalanced state where your ability to deal with the reality of the universe is not in good shape. Yeah, I mean, you're right. What I think it is as well, though, is that you also get the perspective that, you know, you get over-specialization as well, where you get people basically who are know more and more about less and less, and they lose the big picture as well. And... Also, that people seem to get the idea of smallness. You know, so there's a lot of people out there who think they are small, who society is trying to convince you, you can't do anything, you are small, you are small, okay? But what, what I'm trying to convince people, Sol, is that we're all large, okay? That you are, I am, that we're all actually powerful beings, that we all have options and we can do things. And that is basically, you know, where the occultism for me comes from. It comes from empowering people. Whereas it seems so many organisations are trying to convince every one of us that we are small and unimportant. And you know what? I've actually never seen any proof of that. I've only seen people who, uh, who believe that acting that way. In actual fact, I think humans have such incredible powers, not just occult powers, but, you know, we will do so much as a species, you know. I see us spreading to different planes of existence, you know, and across space as well. We're already trying to get onto Mars, and I feel from there we'll expand further out, you know. And that's our future. That's the future of humanity. It's the future we need it to be. And what we can't have is the idea that we're all, you know, unimportant, that we're just, <clears throat> that we are just sort of the smallness but it is a good way to control people, you know. If you're a politician or you're a, a dictator or a king, it's good if you can convince everybody that you're big and everyone else is small, you know. And it's not something I prescribe to at all. I don't believe that's the way the world is at all. And that's part of it. I want people to understand, you know, how important they are and what they can do. Well, in every type of energy, uh, prey and predator, uh, earth, air, fire, water, spirit... Uh, all these kinds of modes in between, all of them have been represented in some culture by a god. That is true, yeah. And that's not a small thing. It's not, no. I mean, the thing is, I really believe that, uh, that really, the way people think of gods and deities now is different to how it used to be. It's the way I tend to use the word magical being. Because it helps us understand it, that what we're talking about is, isn't necessarily something all powerful. Because when you've got many different gods and goddesses, what you have is gods that can only do certain things, ones that can fail, that can get beaten. Uh, you don't have the sort of belief that we have now. But also, if you look back to ancient Egypt, you'll find that people became gods. People started off as ancestors. You know, or they were important people, and then they became gods, not just in Egypt, but in Africa, and you know, it seems to be everywhere where people slowly were, were used that much, they became considered gods. Yes, you know, and that's an important and the thing is, as well, when we think about it, like you said, all of the different energies that we are talking about here are also within ourselves as well. You know, what's outside is also inside, and what's inside is also outside. You know, you know, it, it's a mirror in some ways. 
you know, we're not we're made of the same stuff as the world is. We're not completely separate, you know. We can influence it and change it, but you know, all that stuff that's outside is also inside of us to be accessed as well, you know. Uh, you don't always have to look outside to access things. You can do it from what you have inside as well. Sure. But you have to know it's there or you have to have, I suppose, just some sort of gut instinct for it. Because if you don't know it's there, it's really difficult to access something you don't you don't know exists. Well, and I think that the first thing that you have to do in order to be able to, to do any of that, uh, you have to acknowledge the possibility and the existence and not ridicule it. And our so-called society does an awful lot to limit our thinking and limit our ability to connect with uh, with what's within and without. Yeah, I mean, what they do is they try to surround people. And it's why if you'd notice now that there's the internet, there seems to be like almost more control up than less. You know, they really want to control it because it's easy really to control what somebody thinks, or at least most people, because you just surround them with the idea. Uh, and if you look at it, it's what they do with the decide what's mainstream and they surround people with it. And normally you had the TV, the radio, uh, newspapers, you didn't really have anything else. And that's all they had to do. It's not dissimilar to what terrorists do, really. What they do is if you, you know, if you get someone you want to turn them into a terrorist, you surround them with your ideas. So everywhere they look, that's all there is. Yes. And then the while, they just accept it. And it's the same thing. But now that there is the internet, uh, people have access to ideas and people can share ideas easier. You, you know, there's, I think we can all feel that there's forces out there want to control this. They want to make it so you can't just share ideas because you can't surround people with things to the same extent. Because really, it was easy. All they had to do was to laugh at any strange idea, and you know that was it. You know, even if it got on the TV, they'd just have to laugh at it, and people would say, "Oh, isn't that silly?" But the only reason most people were accepting the ideas they accepted was because they were told by somebody who they thought was important, and the only reason they knew they were important is because they had told them it was. But because that's all they had. You know, it was difficult for people to say things that they didn't know existed. Like I said, they maybe wouldn't even know about the occult as such. How can you get into something if you don't know it? It's difficult, you know. It relies on chance. Uh, but now, as things are out there, people can hear new ideas. And really, I feel the occult isn't about people having to accept any dogma. It's about people thinking for themselves, you know. And the idea that, you know, there is more out there than people want you to believe. You know, you've got access to different forces, uh, different sources of information. That there's different forces in the world, but you don't have to accept anything through trust. You know, you get to judge for yourself. You get to try. You get to perform the occult and decide whether you think it works for you. You know, but either way, at least you know it exists, and that's really what's good about the modern world. You know, I feel we're moving to a to really a golden age. Not just of communication, but of occultism and many strange things. You know, we're moving to a golden age right now, so. And anybody has the ability to tap into that at any time. You can begin that journey at any time. You, it's not, it's not like in Harry Potter where you're either you're born with it or you don't get it. Uh, it it's not, uh, it, it's not like. Some of these people that that say, you know, as a kid I, you know, fell off a horse and hit my head, and now I'm connected. Uh, I mean, certainly there are aspects of that that really uh, occur. Uh, the, there's examples of that, but it, th those aren't the only ways. Someone oh, yeah. can simply decide today I'm going to start changing my energy, start changing my connection, and begin to do things that start to make the difference. Absolutely, yeah. It's a bit like when people talk about family lines of occultism. Every family is a, is a line of occultism because basically speaking, it was very widespread in the past. So somewhere in your line, there was people doing occult, as it is in everybody's family line. But what is important is what you do and what you choose to do. And yeah, and there's, it's not an age thing. It's got nothing to do with age. It doesn't matter what age you are at all. It's got nothing to do with geography. It doesn't matter whether you're physically fit or you're not. It doesn't have anything, any of these things. It's simply got to do with choice. If you choose to be an occultist, then you are one. And that's all it is. It's just about choice. You can choose it. You know, you can choose to change your energy. 
And if you do, the information to do it is out there, you know. Uh, not just my books, I'll mention them again, S. Rob, but you know, you can type S. Rob into Google or look at my website and you can uh, find my books from there. But it's the information's out there for all types of things. It's basically just a matter of uh, reaching out. You, you, this is something you choose. You don't have to have it. You don't have to be born with it. You don't have to be born that somebody, you know, uh, taught you it, which you did really I did. But, you know, it's not about that. It's not even important. You know, you get people who are great occultists who, you know, nobody really in, in their life, nobody when they were kids or even as adults told them anything about it. And they become good, really good occultists, really great occultists because it's about choice. And that's the thing. It's about you choose. This is something you choose, you know. Uh, and that's an important thing to remember because all the films, all the fiction gives you the impression that you don't choose it. That there's no choice. You know, you either do it or you don't because it makes good fiction like that. It makes good fiction because you're transporting somebody to a strange world. But you see, I'm here to tell you and everyone else that this is a strange world. It's here. This is it. You know. And basically, it's something that you choose. You can choose to do this. You can choose to learn any aspect of the occult, you know, or anything. It's all about choice. I agree. Well, hopefully someone listening will take today as their opportunity to start to change their energy and start to change their connection and move to a point where they are manifesting and not just uh, hoping. Okay, that's absolutely fantastic. This has been the World Magic Movement with S. Rob, Saul Ravencraft, Freddie Valentine. Production designed by Myth Made Productions. Produced by S. Rob. Music, A Dark Blue Arc by Pipe Choir. Find them at freemusicarchive.org. This program is licensed for sharing under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International. For more details about usage and sharing, see links in the program description or visit creativecommons.org. This program is licensed by Werevamp Media Limited. See program description for additional links to guest sites and supporting information.